Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Hannah Middleton, uh, the Knowledge Exchange Lead at the Fashion Business School, London College of Fashion. I'm joined today by Louise Mullane, Associate Director of Business and Innovation at London College of Fashion, UAL, and a handful of Fashion Business School students who have very kindly given up their time to uh, throw some light on what we actually refer to as knowledge exchange. So I'd like to start by, first of all, introducing um, the panel. So um, Louise, by way of introduction, would you like to say a couple of words to introduce yourself? Thanks, Hannah. Hello, everyone. I'm Louise Mullane, as Hannah just said, Associate Director of Business and Innovation at London College of Fashion, um, which means that I have the pleasure of working with colleagues across the college um, to develop and um, sort of uh, deliver our knowledge exchange activities that we'll be talking about today. Hi, my name's Tyra, and I'm currently in my third year um, studying fashion buying and merchandising. And for my DIPS placement, I worked at ASOS as a merchandising administrator. So I spent the first half of my department, uh, my placement working for a branded department and then the second half working for an owned by department. Hi, I'm Rebecca Vaughn. Um, I'm on my final year of the MSc Strategic Fashion Management course. Um, for my placement year, I worked at Eason Tate, um, which is a Dutch eyewear brand based in Amsterdam. Um, and I was on their product design team as the product management intern. Hi, my name is Camilla Zdebik, and I'm final year student MSc Strategic Fashion Management, and I did my placement year in reserve brand in Poland. I was marketing assistant in digital marketing department. Hello, um, I'm Scout Whitaker. I'm currently in my third year of studying an MSc in Strategic Fashion Management, um, and my dips was made up of two parts. So firstly, I did the study abroad at Modar International in Paris and then followed that with a six month placement at Chanel in Paris as their social media intern in the digital department. Hi, I'm uh, Lauren Cunningham. I'm on the master's uh, fashion management course, but in the final year, the scary year, um, my dips placement was with the British Fashion Council. Um, and obviously as the name suggests, it was in Britain. So I didn't get to uh, go abroad, but it was still fun. Great, okay, thank you everyone. So um, Fashion Business School, of which we are all part of, um, was ranked second in the 2020 Business of Fashion rankings for graduate and undergraduate courses and awarded best overall, best for long-term value and best for global influence. As a school, we pride ourselves at equipping graduating students with the skills they need to stand out and succeed in the industry. The workplace is complicated and dynamic, where employees are expected to accommodate variations in the demands of everyday tasks. The recent pandemic is further proof that in order to be successful in the workplace, you need to be adaptable and to see change as a positive rather than a negative. We believe it is undesirable to produce graduates who can only work within the restricted framework of solving textbook problems. As the knowledge exchange lead at the Fashion Business School, I'm responsible for ensuring the involvement of industry in the development and delivery of our courses. As a school, we value knowledge exchange. However, what do we really mean by knowledge exchange? Louise, perhaps you could shed a little bit of light on this topic or definition. Thank you, Thank you Hannah, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly try. Um, so knowledge exchange in a nutshell is how we at London College of Fashion engage and interact with the wider world with the intention of innovating and doing good for the benefit of the fashion and related industries, our students, the communities we work with and our environment. It's about how we learn from and develop ideas with those around us with the aim of taking those ideas and putting them into action. To do this, we work with a wide array of partners from fashion and technology startups to large brands, other universities and local community groups to name a few. At London College of Fashion, throughout our more than 100 year history, we've always been entwined with the fashion industry to make sure that our teaching is current, 
relevant, inquiring and dynamic. And to ensure our, grad our students graduate fully prepared to achieve their own personal ambitions for success and contribute to the industry. As a result, knowledge exchange is absolutely embedded across the college and is a really important part of how we make sure we're delivering the best possible fashion education. What this does mean is that knowledge exchange at London College of Fashion is very broad and sometimes it can be difficult to convey what it is. So it helps to think about it in, in practical terms with examples of the types of things that we do in this area. We're very lucky that we have um, our, our students here today to talk with us about their hopefully positive experiences engaging with industry through taking part in the Diploma for Professional Studies. And that's a great example of knowledge exchange. We also use knowledge exchange to drive innovation in the fashion industry. For example, our fashion innovation agencies worked on projects with Microsoft for a number of years. In 2019, the LCF Microsoft Student Accelerator gave LCF students the opportunity to access, access Microsoft's cutting edge technology and mentoring from renowned industry experts to develop new prototypes, which were showcased for industry and the public at last year's Fashion Means Business event at Spitalfields in London. We also have student projects across all levels of study where organisations will set live briefs that are delivered as part of the curriculum. And these projects are a brilliant opportunity for students to experience what it's like to develop ideas and often present them directly to a company and gain feedback. This is invaluable for our students not only to gain the experience for their portfolios, but it's also great to learn new skills and make connections with potential future employers or collaborators. And while the community, while the companies who set the briefs benefit from working with our talented students and academics with vast experience and expertise in knowledge exchange to develop fresh ideas. So we have hundreds of knowledge exchange activities happening across the college every year. Along with our teaching and research, it's what makes London College of Fashion a really vibrant place to study at and to partner with. Brilliant. Demystified knowledge exchange, so the exchange of, of knowledge, I suppose. It's a two-way partnership. Industry exchanging knowledge with ourselves and ourselves exchanging knowledge with the industry and our partners. Is that right to say, Louise? Absolutely, Hannah. And it's about that mutual benefit as well. It's sort of, it's, it's very much a two way thing. So when we, you know, when, whenever we have any of these connections, interactions, it's all about sort of bringing that benefit to everyone who's involved. Brilliant. I think it's particularly appropriate that we that we broach the subject today. As this is um, uh, this event um, centres around our four pillars as a school, which are people, planet, profit, and purpose. And today's for, for focus is actually on people. So really, people are central to that knowledge e exchange, and in order for knowledge exchange to to happen, I suppose. So. Uh, Thank you to um, all of the students who've joined us today. As Louise pointed out, they have all been actively engaged in knowledge exchange um, because they've been involved with our Diploma of Professional Studies, which we call DIPS. So knowledge exchange um, is an excellent example of DIPS. Uh, sorry, D DIPS is an excellent example of knowledge exchange. Um, and uh, we run the DIPS project here at London College of Fashion um, across a variety of courses. So students studying the BSc Honours in Fashion Management, the MSc Strategic Fashion Management, BA Honours Buying and Merchandising, the BA Honours Fashion Marketing, and BA Honours Visual Merchandising and Branding, and MSc Cosmetic Science have the opportunity to spend a year in the industry or at one of our partner universities between their second and third years of study. A requirement of the Diploma Award is that 
30 weeks of professional placement must be completed in full. There is flexibility to combine a placement in industry, in the case of Scout, with a period of one term or a semester of studying abroad at one of our partner universities. So I think what's great about the diploma is that academic studies continue through the completion of a written 5,000 word report and 2,000 word reflection whilst the students are actually engaging in the placement. And that report focuses on the opportunities and challenges relating to the professional placement. And it's not only continues the development of the students' study skills, but also allows the ongoing development of their research, analytical and evaluative skills. So the Diploma in Professional Studies, DIPS, aims to develop an appreciation of the culture and practice of the workplace. Put course content and study into perspective. Develop transferable skills and enhance students' opportunities for career or academic progression. I'm very grateful to all of uh, the DIP students, um, Scout, Tara, Lauren, Rebecca, and Camilla for joining us today. What um, would be, uh, what I'd really like you to, each of you to do is just expand a little bit on your DIPS experience. Give us insights into the report that you've produced and uh, some of the benefits that you um, found with completing DIPS and being actively engaged in knowledge exchange. So could I please hand over to Scout Whitaker? Yes, hi. Um, so just to refresh, I did the study abroad at Modart um, and then the placement at Chanel in Paris as a social media intern, um, where I was responsible for content planning, content distribution to Chanel markets worldwide, um, social media analytics and social media posting. Um, and so my report on both of those experiences uh, but mostly for Chanel was uh, how Chanel can improve current and prospective social media users experiences through personalized content on specialized platforms to gain more clients and increase loyalty. So a little bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, and it focused on the Chanel digital presence and how this could be improved um, to better experiences all around um, and also of course gaining new clients um, because a brand social media strategy is crucial uh, in this day and age. Um, so I found that Chanel must tailor their offerings and activations on current and future platforms with a stronger purpose for each specific platform where different consumers are located to adapt to their behaviors and reap the rewards of deep personalization for each specific market. Um, and I also found that digitalization is providing Chanel the tools to combat growing competition globally. Um, and my recommendation um, overall was to use storytelling, um, live streaming, dark social media and micro influencers as well as joining new platforms um, using user-generated content where appropriate um, to give Chanel the personalized relationship with current and potential consumers with loyalty, interest and engagement to increase sales, which is always the goal. <laughs> um, so key learnings from the report were ultimately all content creation needs to lead to sales in some form um, and with more people using social media than ever before, uh, I think it was estimated 3.5 billion people just in 2019, um, the power of social media and the ability for brands to be able to react quickly to situations that are arising every day is more important than ever. Um, an acute level of personalization in all aspects of a consumer's journey is also no longer an added bonus, it's a basic expectation. Um, and it's also important to focus on your most important consumer, even if it's not the vast majority of who your marketing is targeted towards. Um, 
So that's the report. Um, so, so yeah, just on that scout. Um, so you just uh, listed your recommendations. Um, mm -hmm. Was Chanel already sort of uh, following? You know, were you sort of building on things that Chanel was were, were already doing, or did you actually come up with the recommendations for for actions that they could perhaps take, which they weren't taking? Um, most of them were for what they weren't currently doing. Um, they were just as I was writing this report. Um, we had just done um, our first live stream ever, so that was that was a big part of my report talking about how live streaming is becoming more important. Um, but yes, they were, I mean, they are things that we were talking about internally, especially dark social media was something that my manager was talking to me about a lot, but yeah, most of them are recommendations that they weren't currently doing. Brilliant. So that's admirable So, So do you perhaps feel that um, some of your first and second year studies had set you up quite nicely for, um, for the, your time at Chanel or was it more to do with life experience? Um, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I think dips with my course, the MSc uh, fashion management, I, I think that they go hand in hand, absolutely. And you couldn't, I don't think I would have the same experience on fashion management if I hadn't done dips. And if I hadn't had the internship experience that I'd had, um, but I mean, definitely all of the modules that we had done throughout year one and two on marketing and PR and logistics and everything that we had covered kind of helped me with Chanel, especially because it's such a huge company that you're only really exposed to your team. Um, so it's quite focused in on where you, where you are with them. And did Chanel adopt some of your recommendations or all of your recommendations? Um, They've re, not all, they've rejigged the team as I left. So there was a lot more personalization towards um, the Asian markets specifically. So Thailand, China, Japan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure um, the insights that your report produced were invaluable to, to the business and, and drove an increase in social media following. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and then Tara Campbell, would you like to? Hello. Um, so yeah, like I said, I did my placement at ASOS. Um, so I worked for both a branded department called High Street EU Brands, and then I spent the rest of my time on their own by sportswear brand Four Five Zero Five. So my project investigated how greater efficiency in their delivery process and product management would improve speed to market for women's wear high street EU brands. So I think quite early on, it was apparent that the delivery process needed refining. Um, and the main issue here was that the third party brands were sending their samples late. Um, so my research was to sort of solve this problem. Um, and so I firstly looked at the correlation between speed to market and product performance by assessing the outcome of our own late lines. And sales were visibly a lot lower for styles that didn't follow their planned intake month, particularly for like trend led and seasonal late lines. Um, so it proved that speed to like timing was key with speed to market, um, and especially in reducing the amount of like promotional activity and markdown activity to claw back the sales and reduce cover. Um, I also think that it highlighted the missed sales opportunity, especially with um, the cost of cancellation. So I worked it out on sort of like a hypothetical basis and it was quite a lot. It was here. Yeah. Um, so then because I was working on two different departments, I wanted to sort of, to sort of compare the processes um, to see if one was at more of an advantage. And there was no real like standout winner as a lot of their priorities like led to the advantages and disadvantages. So um, for e EU brands, they focused a lot more on speed to market. So it meant their intake was a lot more flexible and um, they were able to sustain their inventory by using both forward order and stocks. So they were a lot more reactive to trends compared with um, 4505 um but i guess the downside here was that they were using 
um, not very good transportation methods, like airing a lot of their stock to the US. And although that reduced like the delivery time from like, four weeks to four days, obviously it's not a very sustainable practice. So um, yeah, swings and roundabouts. Um, and then also the, we face a lot of brand stock shortages. So if the brand had run out of stock, it sort of affected us as we were set on certain styles or bestsellers and we weren't able to get them. Um, so in that respect, I think 4505 had a more dynamic um, system as they use suppliers both offshore and nearshore in order to be more cost effective and they were able to phase their stock more efficiently and like intake forecast but I guess the disruption of COVID definitely questioned their reliance on manufacturing in the Far East um, so from this I thought it was important to sort of understand the key drivers of efficient supply chains and strong business to business relationships was fundamental. And I think the three main factors were the use of communication, um, transparency and negotiation to benefit both parties. So in order to resolve this problem of the delays in newness, I um, suggested a different way of studio production. So I said they could use a company called Zkit that already collaborated with them um, earlier this year in order to show consumers how garments would look on different models. Um, and these models had varying body types, so it was really diverse and inclusive. And I thought this could um, sort of initiate the process of 3D virtual fit sampling, because um, that would eliminate the use of sending physical samples back and forth from the third brand to ASOS. And obviously you'd be able to modify any problems digitally and a lot faster. Um, so in terms of like key learnings and achievements from writing this report, I think it allowed me to think a lot more critically um, as I was able to come up with a credible solution to the problem. And also in my personal development, I'd say, because I don't think I realized quite how like demanding emotionally and physically working in like such a fast retail environment was um so yeah adapting to these changes kind of helped me grow brilliant and uh so sorry um was this a problem that asos had actually noticed or recognized or was it a problem that you recognized as a fresh pair of eyes going into the business i think they were always trying to be the first to market being like this global um retailer trying to satisfy their 20 something market. And um, they were always looking for ways to improve their speed to market. But I think it was visibly noticeable on my department where um, especially high street compared to 4505 because turnaround was so quick. Um, but then we noticed that like, say like a mango style had already gone live on their site four weeks prior to it doing on our site. So it was trying to get a right, the right balance there. Yeah, and obviously if, if Star's gone live on, on another site before going on live on ASOS and customers already started buying it. and Exactly, yeah. For you to sell it. So, um, and I, I imagine, you know, coming from a, a buying merchandising background myself, you know, in a, a, the office is normally quite busy. So I suppose you had the advantage because, you know, you, you had the time um, to yeah. investigate and research and... Um, yeah, come up with recommendations. Do you know if they 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 actually took you well, uh, followed the recommendations you made? If you had any feedback? Not as of yet, but I know they are trying to um, change their ways of studio production. So I think virtual three D virtual fit sampling is definitely an a avenue they can go down. Um, I guess they're at the minute trying to weigh up upfront costs and the benefits that they would. Um, achieve from using that technology but I think the rewards are definitely um, going to be seen using that as their production. Brilliant that's great okay thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and then we have uh, Lauren Cunningham. Hi Lauren. Hi sorry I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Um, I did my placement with the British Fashion Council, so it's um, known in industry as the BFC, 
anyone who's not aware of it, it's a not-for-profit organization that sort of sits as a almost governmental body for a lot of UK fashion brands, independent brands especially. Um, so they run all of London Fashion Weeks, they run the Fashion Awards, and they also have multiple charities within them. So they can give grants to students or um, grants to new designers trying to come up through the business, but might need support with how to run supply chains or might need some monetary funding to get their business off the ground and things like that. So it's really, really super important on all levels. Um, and the team's only 50 people. So it's quite crazy when you think of the amount of work that they do, that it's just this tiny, tiny team behind everything, basically. Um, and it was just fantastic, I think. I think for me, being in the smaller team, you got to see how it worked from every angle and you got to see how Fashion Week was put together to how you might be able to support students and learning about sustainability to trying to inspire the industry. I don't know, trying to work with them through Brexit and things like that. So everything sort of that you would never expect to do, you were doing. Um, so for my report, because it's a not-for-profit organization and they do have charities within them, they need funding for that. And the BFC do only three events per year, which they can raise money for those charities through. So it's the Fashion Awards and two London Fashion Week festivals. So London Fashion Week Festival, a lot of you might be familiar with it. It's been going for quite a while now. And it's basically a consumer event that tags on the last day or the last two days of London Fashion Week. And every season this has changed format slightly. But for me, I was going to London Fashion Week festivals since I was about 14, 15 with my mum. So to see it from there to then be involved with it was quite crazy. But for me, I just didn't think it the event was as good as it could be. Um, so just to give you an idea for anyone who's not aware of it, um, usually it's sort of you buy a ticket, um, you can get a gift bag and you might see a fashion show or two and a talk. And the talk can be anyone from, um, oh, I'm trying to think, like one of the fashion editors of Vogue to David Gandhi. They're quite um, influential people that do these talks. Um, but for me, every year I saw the ticket price increase. And I think maybe it was 2019, the tickets were 75 to 100 pounds. And I think for the BFC, their three pillars are inform, educate, inspire. And I just didn't think that the event with the ticket price that high aligned with those pillars. In my head, inform, educate, inspire, you're gonna to go to younger students sort of our age, and a lot of us can't afford a hundred pounds for this ticket. So my report was sort of, it looked at how to market the event more effectively to um, a better target audience, but really I just kind of uh, gave suggestions on what I thought the event should be. Um, which was really interesting. And I do think they took some of it on board. Um, but obviously hasn't gone ahead for the past, I'm trying to think how long we've been in lockdown now, two seasons um, because of the restrictions. But I'm really interested to see how they're gonna do it in February. So hopefully we'll see that they might have picked up a couple of more suggestions, maybe lowered the ticket prices, maybe brought the unis in so you could do sort of a more of a um, sort of really young students of, oh, this is how you can get into buying. Because I don't know about anyone else, but when I joined LCF, I didn't know about the hundreds of different jobs that come within fashion. I knew I wanted to do fashion, but I had no idea what a buyer was or a merchandiser was and things like that. So I think that's something that really could be pushed to sort of your GSHC A level students um, and that event would be quite a nice way to do it. Uh, my key learnings from the placement would be so many things. Um, I was in the marketing team and when I joined there was a an assistant above me. Two months into my placement the assistant left and no one was no one came in to replace her so automatically I sort of jumped up in that responsibility um, which was the best thing that happened to me. I mean, maybe not for her, but I was I was joyed about it because I got to do so much extra stuff. Um, I think 
the last thing I did before I left was start this Fashion Times Music series. So I sort of had the freedom to run that and we were working with Polydor Records. I had Youngblood in talking to Per Gottesen, Celeste. Um, I'm trying to think who else, so many people. Um, it was just quite insane. So you're sat there in a room with Halsey and uh, Per Gottesen and Youngblood just having a conversation. And it's, it's quite mad. So I think the placement for me just, you know, it wasn't all about celebrities. I have to say, I did actually learn some really good things as well. Um, but you got to do things that I would have never dreamt of being able to do before. Um, and yeah, I think I've sort of probably touched on achievements and in, in the fact that, yeah, we got to just do all of that amazing, amazing stuff. So Lauren, um, when you first arrived, um, you know, was it, was it clear that they needed uh, a bit of advice and guidance um, with the event, with the festival? Or was it something that you had actually picked up on um, yourself and taken the initiative to sort of pick that as your topic of research? Yeah, I think it was clear um, from a financial perspective, maybe, not to go into too much detail on that, but that's, uh, it was probably clear from that perspective that something needed to change. Whether it was thought of as a big issue, I'm not sure. But for me, it was one of those things that I just thought this is glaringly obvious to a student. I think that was the interesting part because I had a different perspective to everyone else. You know, I wasn't, um, before that, I wasn't having an annual salary. So I, a hundred pounds is a lot of money. Um, so to some people that are just working full time, a hundred pounds might not be a lot um, for that ticket. So I think that's what, I could come in and say, actually, if you want to inform, educate and inspire people, they're not going to come for this. Um, and, and the main the main target market for that festival. I mean, I've, I've been there for a, a number of years and I think it's, a, a you know, I've, I've got many happy memories of being there, but it is to target the younger demographic. And I think initially tickets were were a lot cheaper. I mean, I remember yeah. when I went, it definitely wasn't 75 pounds to 100 pounds. I think it was more around the sort of 10 to 20 pound mark. And, you know, that's not me showing my age. I think that's just probably a, ch a change in, um, in their sort of strategy, I suppose. Yeah, it definitely did. It changed strategy to be a more sort of luxury event, which I fully understood. And it was, it was one way of thinking about it. Um, but for me, I just had a different opinion and I thought, this is my chance to show them that opinion. Um, and I think when you did look around the room, when you were getting those higher price tickets, it was middle-aged mums on their day out, which I don't, you know, that's great, but maybe they're not gonna be the next generation of stylists or buyers or merchandisers. Um, maybe they will, but you know, probably not. <laughs> that align with their pillars as you quite rightly pointed out. Yeah, it just seemed to be a bit of a missed opportunity. Yeah, I would say so. I really hope that event will come back in a sort of different way, um, whether it's February, whether it's next September. I guess I'll have to wait and see. So watch this space. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Then we have uh, Rebecca Vaughan. Thank you, Rebecca. There we go. All right. So yeah, um, I worked at Ace and Tate, um, which is yeah eyewear brand in the Netherlands, um, and I worked as the product management intern um, on the product design team. So I worked really closely with the technical designers along with the suppliers um, and then also different teams um, within the company as well. So like PR, because um, it was a very small, small company. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity and responsibilities put on me even just with the intern title. Um, so we worked on multiple seasons, obviously at all at different stages in the cycle. Um, and I was responsible for keeping an overview of all the prototypes, photo samples, their progress, and making sure to give weekly updates to everyone to keep them on track. Um, I also worked on sourcing new suppliers, setting out new developments while continuing daily contact with our current suppliers um, over current and possible developments. Um, so we held biweekly meetings with suppliers over like video calls, um, which in the beginning I, 
was so nervous during the first one. I didn't even say a word, I don't think. But then over time, my um, my man manager actually encouraged me to take the lead in the leadings and to kind of be one of the ones moving the conversation around. Um, I helped place orders for samples on different stages of the product cycle um, and kept photo samples labeled and available for the PR team or if we had anybody coming in to take kind of a look at the brand, things like that. Um, so when it came to my report, um, obviously I was focusing on product development. Um, so mine was titled, A Look Into Children's Eyewear. Um, so obviously I focused on the possibility of implementing a children's eyewear range at Ace and Tate. Um, this topic for the report was actually brought straight away in by, um, my manager who was like, this is a concept we've always been thinking about, but nobody's actually had the time to look into it. Um, so we don't even know, like with all the facts, if it would be something we would want to do or not. Um, so my main objectives for the report were obviously researching into children's eyewear. So the design and production process, um, along with what requirements there are to compensate for children's continuous developments into adulthood but also like for example metal eyewear isn't a really a great idea for kids not only because it will break more easily but because kids have more of a reaction to nickel um and so like they wouldn't really be able to wear it, it would break them out a lot um and then evaluating also if the customer base would be responsive to the idea of a children's eyewear range, um, as well as it, if it fits in with the Ace and Tate brand image and market standings. Um, and then after kind of looking into everything, what my recommendations would be. So the type of frames to create, if they should at all, um, and with technical concepts and materials to use, um, along with the implementation of any groundwork which could lead to the idea to coming to life for the company. Um, so I found out surprisingly actually that the children's eyewear is one of the fastest developing markets, um, but also in store customers were also coming in to ask about or request about it. So it definitely seemed like a real possibility, like something that actually this is a good idea. One of the main reasons like, like children's eyewear is becoming such a thing is because of technology and how it's having a negative impact on our eye health. Um, and so it's actually people are needing glasses younger and younger now. Um, and so looked into the age range and the group that seemed like the best fit for it was about eight to 12 years old. But also something that would be beneficial is having smaller frames anyways, because some people do have smaller heads and so some of the frames that would be considered normal size still look too big and it's not as flattering and it's something you wear on your face. So you want it to look nice. Um, and then, however, some stores are considered to be more um, kid friendly. And so we did send out a survey to all of the stores that we had to see what they thought um, and if their customers would actually be interested in it. But a lot of the more ones based in cities were less kid interested and less kid focused or family style. Um, so that was kind of one of the things that would be difficult to implement it overall because not every bit or every city was interested in having children's eyewear. Um, another thing was there's a lot more legal issues with implementing children's eyewear. Obviously they need to be guaranteed to be safe. Um, and Ace and Tate also offers eye testing in store um, for free, but for children um, in certain um, countries or in certain cities, the law differentiates about like what you're actually allowed to do if you're allowed to measure their eyes at all. Because sometimes it has to be in a proper optician's office, even though they are fully trained opticians. Um, so it started, although the, the concept and actually making the frames, that was quite easy in picking out the range took ones from the more classical frames and then just made the miniature versions, but um, adjusting with like special springs so they can break less easily um, and making sure it's acetate. Um, but so the actual implementation bit would have been the most difficult and seems to actually be quite complicated. Um, so they, I haven't 
noticed any children's eyewear ranges coming out, um, but they mainly focus on sustainability. So I noticed in um, through their like Instagram and stuff, they've actually been coming out with things more um, geared towards sustainability, which is also one of the biggest um, conversations that they're having at the Ace and Tate. So yeah. So it sounds like you've got a, another whole uh, dips project there, or maybe a dissertation. Yeah. On sort of how how to um, overcome some of the challenges of actually making this a reality. Um, it's interesting to hear that the the number of uh, children wearing glasses is on the increase. It doesn't surprise me with uh, the amount of time they perhaps spend in front of digital screens, as you quite rightly pointed out. But it does sound like there's a market, even if it's not something that could be adop adopted by every single Ace and Tate uh, location. Um, I think uh, what's particularly interesting is the fact that as a, as a business, they had an understanding that there was an opportunity here, but they just didn't have the time to actually conduct the research and investigate, which is where you came in. Yeah, the, the team was quite small. So for product development, it was just me and my boss, City. And then um, we had two technical designers. Um, and so just to start out with, we were um, kind of juggling like almost four seasons at once, all at different stages of the cycle while um, we had um, a person who was solely there to focus on sustainability. So then they would come in and they would be like, okay, what about if we could do a project like this? What about that? Um, so I think children's eyewear would have required almost its own entire team. Um, it, Cause it was just, it was almost too much, especially if you wanted to kind of um, tie into like the different seasons for the, for the adults. Cause that was one of the things that we were thinking about was like a lot of kid comes in kids come in and they're like, oh, I want one that kind of looks like my parents. So then it's almost like you have to always tie it together and make sure that they've got similar options because there are some children's eyewear brands available, but the issue is they're very kitty and like neon yellow and this like milky kind of acetate. And it's not like the most attractive. And there are some kids as, you know, the people need glasses, they're more like, as they get older, they're more aware of what they're wearing and they're like, I don't want to do that. So <laughs> that was kind of one of the reasons why we also thought it would be a good idea. But yeah, it was just, it, it would be a lot to take on, I think, so. But at least you've potentially started the ball rolling, if nothing else, just given an insight into the complexities of it. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a lot that we just like, we didn't even think about like the kids being able or not able to have their eyes tested in the store. That wasn't even something we thought about. And then it was like, oh, apparently that's a big deal. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was good to keep, uh, to kind of learn actually what would it entail. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And then last but not least, uh, Camilla Zedevic. Hi, I'm Camilla. I did my placement here in Reserve Brand. It's a Polish brand which has 25, uh, 25, which has stores in 25 countries across the uh, globe. I was marketing assistant in digital marketing department. So my tasks were like so different. I did photo shoot production. I was collaborating with influencers, working closely with legal and finance department. So I decided to do my DIPS project on an investigation into how the power of influencer marketing and content they create can enhance the growth of reserved followers on Instagram. Because the reserve goal that time was to achieve 1 million followers on Instagram. I was looking at their past uh, collaborations and past strategy uh, on Instagram. Uh, I was doing content alignment analysis in terms of like, comments, reach, interactions, and what type of influencers is involved in the campaigns. So the main findings which I found are from the three types of influencers, which are mega, micro, nano. The most effective collaborations are with micro influencers, which has up to 100,000 followers. Uh, but the collaborations needs to be really authentic because people don't buy when 
you just pay influencer to promote your stuff. They need to see the real outcome and the real relationship between brand and influencer. However, it, reserved customers are also looking for collaborations with celebrity endorsement or mega influencers, which is really interesting But because now the trend is doing collaborations with micro influencers. The company had to be aware that they also need to launch campaigns with big influencers. Um, key learnings from my placement year, basically like project management and working under time pressure because it wasn't easy to like doing your placement year and then writing your report when you need to work full time. It was like the first thing we need to look at it. Uh, also, I had an opportunity to look how the strategy, strategy is created, which was completely new for me because we had the background at the university, how the strategy should be done, but then you can see in the real life how the people are doing the strategy and then the implementation through the year. Um, and from the key achievements from the placement, I got employment after the placement year. So I highly recommend everyone to do the placement year. And yeah. That's brilliant. And Camilla, I think you're probably being um, slightly secretive here, but actually um, you did share with us yesterday that you were instrumental in achieving that 1 million target. Yeah, yeah we, we achieved 1 million which is commendable in, its, in itself. So congratulations. Thank um, so thank you to all of you for sharing your experiences. Um, I suppose just one sort of final question um, before um, we answer any questions. At the moment, we have no questions uh, being asked. So um, yeah, so I suppose I'd just like to ask each of you uh, to share with me ways that the placement has helped your sort of personal, professional and career development. So um, uh, maybe we'll go the other way around this time. So if I start with you, Camilla. Mm, for my personal development, basically you need to grow up really fast. I mean, even if you are grown up, you need to like, you are talking to people so much older than you are and you need to be still professional and don't look like a person who is 20 years old. Um, from other staff, like the time management is crucial and working under time pressure because you don't have time for doing stuff. You, if something needs to be done now, it needs to be done now. You can say like, oh, I will do it tomorrow or in 10 days. And in terms of my professional career, so I've got an employment, which is really nice because you know, like after graduation, which I will be graduating this year, I will already have three years of full-time ex working experience. And I think we know what we can expect after we will graduate. So we, we, we exactly like be there and not, we, can, we know where we can look for another job or come back to the companies we used to work. So this is main. Fantastic opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Rebecca? Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of where to begin on what changed for me by doing the placement year. Um, I, I think the biggest thing going in for me was confidence levels. I was like terrified of everything just because I didn't know what was going to happen or kind of, you know, if you accidentally like misspell even somebody's name in the email it's like the most terrifying thing that ever happens to you on like when you just start um and so I quickly yeah as Camilla said you just have to grow up in a sense you have to just be thrust into it and then you just grow so much um my confidence massively improved um and for me that was yeah my biggest kind of hindrance I was just a bit too like nervous about everything. I was like, oh, you actually want me to do this? Wait, let me double check everything. And then I was just sending emails out left, right and center, leading meetings and, you know, being able to just take on projects. And that was just so exciting to come out and just being like, oh yeah, I know what I'm doing. Um, 
And then I think also something that changed for me. So originally I was very interested in buying and still am, but mainly now geared towards the product development side. I didn't realize that I could kind of go into it and be more hands-on than I was in previous buying roles I'd, um, buying admin roles I'd been in. Um, so that was something that I was like, oh, okay, actually when I'm searching for jobs later on, I actually want to look towards more towards product development than actual buying. Um, and then I think, yeah, I just think the, the confidence was really the biggest thing for me. And then, yeah, going into the workplace now, I know what I kind of I actually like, oh, okay, so this is how it works. This is okay. I can, I'm like calm now I can do it. Um, and yeah, I know more so where I'm, my path is kind of heading, which I think at our age, that's like massive to actually be like, oh, okay, so no, this is what I thought I wanted to do. And it actually is. So you got that right. Like, good job. <laughs> Confirmation. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Lauren? Um, I think everything Becca and Camilla said about growing up and confidence is just so huge. Um, I think it affected me more than I probably realized. I still have friends now who have master's degrees in other complete different unis and things like that. And they will send me emails for when they're going out to job roles and say, oh, you know how to write emails. Is this okay? And things like that. So things that you might have picked up that you didn't even know you picked up. And people, other people recognize it more than you do. Um, so I think, well, also when I read their emails, I'm like, mm, no, <laughs> good job I checked that. Um, so I think, yeah. And then for career uh, progression, I have to say every opportunity I've been offered so far has come through a connection at the BFC that I worked with. So, I mean, you can't really um, put a price on that. That's quite invalu invaluable. So, yeah. Brilliant. Great. Thank you very much, Lauren. And Tara? Yeah, again, with the confidence thing, I would definitely say that was probably my key takeout from um, doing DIPS. Um, even like just accepting to talk today at this event, I probably would have never have done this a year ago. So um, I guess it's become a little bit easier now to speak in front of people. Um, but again, just like expanding my network with people, like I still have a lot of contact with the people that I was working with, um, which is really nice. And then I think from an academic perspective, like writing the report would definitely help with my dissertation and like time management, making sure that everything's done in time. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. And Scout. Yeah, so not to repeat what everybody else has said, but I just think confidence has been personally and professionally just the, the biggest thing that you can take from it. I mean, I, I started the study abroad, obviously having to speak French and learn everything in French, doing lectures in French, having to write essays and do tests and exams in another language. So I really struggled with that. When I first started, I just refused to speak in the classroom. Like I just wouldn't ask questions or anything because I was just you know firstly not understanding everything but also I was just too nervous to speak French in front of all these people and then I had this really great kind of full circle moment at the end with my last week and my last day presenting um, like a piece of work a presentation to my whole class alone in French um, being able to discuss it with the teacher in the class in French so you know, it just, it, it throws you in the deep end with the study abroad and the placement, but it just shows you that, you know, you're capable of so much more than you think you are. Um, yeah. Being pushed out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, um, actually, Louise, it's very interesting listening to everything the students have said, because we, we're currently in the process of working out ways to actually weigh up and measure knowledge exchange. It would appear that a lot of um, kind of the outcomes of knowledge exchange is that growth in confidence and how do we actually go about measuring something like that? I suppose quite a challenge. Very good question, Hannah, and I think something that we we really need to think about. And thank you, everyone, so much for sharing. Um, it's been really great to hear about your experiences. And I just I just really love that you've all said that so much of what you've 
taken from the experience isn't just you know the the opportunities but also that really sort of intangible the the personal um that you've you've sort of all taken from it so yeah definitely a lot for for us to learn from you all as well yeah. so thank you everyone um I, mean, we, I don't know if we have any questions um we've got about four minutes before we we end the session if anyone has any questions from the from the floor please ask if not, let's give it a couple of minutes. Any potential DIP students out there? Any employees that would like? Can I ask a quick one? Of course you can. Yes, um, I suppose just thinking about, you know, if you could if you could go back in time and um, give yourself any advice about, you know, what the experience looks like and what, what you get out of it, what, what advice would you would you give to make the most of the experience? Uh, anyone who wants to answer. Um, I think the advice I would give myself is that I was very um, geared toward being in Paris and being in a French luxury brand. And obviously we have horror stories that have <laughs> Um, arisen throughout the years and stories of interns and whatever and you don't really get to learn a lot but I think and so you know those opinions do kind of affect you and you get nervous about making applications to these big brands and things but my experience with Chanel and friends who also did dips they're they are incredible you know you learn so much you have so much responsibility it's it's not scary at all they're the loveliest people um so yeah I just think that that would be the biggest thing I would go back and to anyone that is thinking of doing dips now you know don't be intimidated by you know industry kind of reputations <laughs> not as scary as you think yeah any other advice you have one I second what scout says um for me i applied actually for a pr role at the bfc and didn't get it um and i was so gutted i thought oh my god what am i gonna do now like all my friends are on depth so i've not got anything and then a week later i got a call from the marketing manager saying oh pr have sent through your application they think you should do this job do you want it um so i would say just keep going you know, there's a lot of people that I know people that maybe applied for two, three things, didn't get it and gave up. And they really, they really did uh, regret not doing the dips thing in the end. So you will get something. You just have to keep trying and hopefully it will work out. And it is a hugely competitive industry and, you know, it requires, it requires you to, to, to have that, you know, not giving up mentality, I suppose, in order to succeed because it's, large number of people out there who you know justifiably say because it's a great industry but who want to be part of the industry yeah so i think that actually uh lauren you just answered the question the one question we had which was how did you find about how did you find the bfc internship um you perhaps just answered that but um yeah i think the bfc internship was great they do one in every department so you know, they do say only apply for one. And I mean, in my case, I did just apply for the one and I got moved. So I think that is really true. They will try and put you wherever they think you would best fit. Um, I would say the BFC, I couldn't have picked a better place. So I think uh, go for it, but do definitely do your research um, because I actually was able to, I in interviewed the last set of dips students to take on my role um, so I got to pick um, <laughs> so I would say we did have a lot of people come to us who had no idea what the BFC was who said oh I can't wait to design and things like that and I thought mm, like that's great but you, you would be better suited somewhere else so I think you just need to know what they are what they're about um, it's not all fashion weeks they really are focused on their sort of charity 
um, an educational side. So really do sort of do your research on that. Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I think we're going to reach the end of the session. Um, really appreciate all of your time. Uh, Louise, thank you very much for coming and shredding a bit of light on um, what is knowledge exchange. Thank you for having me. And thank you, um, the panel, for sharing your insights and experience. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.